From Isaiah chapter 9, we find these words, starting in verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there is no end. upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this and turning in your scriptures to John, first chapter, these words are found. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son. And the gospel was the Word. And the Word was with the Son. And the Son was with God. And the Son was of God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made which was made. And in him was the gospel. And the gospel was the life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the world. And the world perceiveth it not. Good morning. I want to thank you, John, Wayne, and Tom, for presenting such thoughtful and insightful music and allowing the Lord to touch your heart and to guide your thoughts. Many times, the Lord has gone before us and he has shown us the way in our lives and I'd like for us to consider these words but not so much the first two verses from John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoso believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting light for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But this is what I would like for you to pay particular attention to. Going on into verse 18. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who is, believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten, Son of God, which before was preached by the mouth of the holy prophets, for they testified of him. And this is the condemnation, 
that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. For everyone who doeth evil hateth the light, and neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he who loveth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest. And he who obeyeth the truth, the works with he doeth are of God. I'd like to propose and offer to you a challenge. That living in the darkness is really kind of foolish. In the light of all the evidence that we have this day, in this time, in this hour, so to speak, we have evidences of God's existence. For the telescopes have brought to us the outermost reaches of the beauty of his galaxies, the beauty of his stars, the essence of his being. And what yet have we seen? We have seen into his soul even the light and the light of his son, Christ Jesus. For what have those pictures brought to us but an evidence that we have a small and minute understanding of our existence today. Only around about us, but a small distance, do we understand and feel what it is to be loved by God. Think again what that immense magnitude might be if we were to expand that love and to understand that love a little bit higher, a little bit more to his level and his understanding. We ask ourselves, why don't people believe in God? And he gives us the answer in 1 John. In him, and that's with a capital H, was life. In other words, Jesus is that source of life that we must grab hold of and wrap our arms around at this point in our life just to hang on. And it goes on to say, the light was the life of men. Do you know what that means to me? That means that this Jesus, this person that came down and condescended to be here and live on this earth in the form of man, gives enlightenment about God about life through his example. This was his ultimate purpose and meaning as he came down here to this earth to show us the way that we might understand 
but a small portion, a small portion of God's love for us. And John goes on to add that the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. I think that one large reason that people don't comprehend God is that we have a very small surrounding of things that we do comprehend and that God is so large and so massive and so inexplainably without end how can we possibly comprehend it but a little bit I can't even comprehend a light year, even though I understand the math behind it. Light travels at a certain speed, and it takes that one year to travel at that speed across a vast distance. The universe is many light years across, and yet God in his infinite wisdom, is master of that universe. I'm going to suggest that possibly the main reason that people do not comprehend the existence of God is because of man's sin. I've done this, maybe you have, in a time in my life when I did not want to follow Christ, when I did not comprehend God, I put up an intelligent smokescreen, if you will, on the many reasons why I didn't want to follow God, why I couldn't follow God, why I did not have the patience nor the time, and more other things were more important in my life at that time to follow the tendencies of Christ our Lord and Savior. And you know what this one sin is? At least in my life. It's man's desire to be in control, to do things his way. And without it, we wouldn't strike out on our own. Without it, we wouldn't accomplish the things that we have accomplished. But through it, God has guided this nation. Because as a nation, we have believed that we have been founded. And he has brought about the existence of this nation under God. Jesus is that light. And is the source of all light and good from God. And I would propose to you that living life in the darkness doesn't make sense and is rather foolish. My point and I'll share a little story. Long about 15, 
I did not like to have nor take direction from my father. Yeah. And I did everything short of standing in his face and denying what he wanted me to do because that would have incurred his wrath. One Thanksgiving, I made a small mistake. He told me to go down and check on the cows. It was rainy, it was nasty, it was wet. And oh, by the way, don't take the four-wheel drive truck. I want you to walk. I didn't do that. I made up my mind I was going to do my own will, my own thing. And I went out and I got in the truck, started it, and drove down to check on the cows. To make a very long, long story short, I got that truck stuck, clear up to the doors. And when I opened the door, there was mud and water right next to me. Because I decided by that time that I couldn't get it out on my own. I got out, I didn't have on boots, I just had on shoes, and it was up to my knees. I shoved on the back, futile, very futile. It wasn't going anywhere. And so after I slugged out of the mud, I walked back home. My father didn't say a word. He heard the door open and he looked down at me and he started to go get his coat because he knew what I had done because I was muddy from my waist down. Brothers and sisters, to not have your father talk to you, I would have much rather had him yell at me. We rode the tractor in silence. Him riding on the tractor and me on the back. And we pulled the truck out. Not a word. But you know something? He didn't get muddy because I got more muddy because I was the one that had to slog back into the truck and, and then as he as I hooked up the chain and he got ready to pull he was on the tractor when we got back to the house we'd put the truck up we'd put the tractor up and we were walking back into the house and he said, where do you think you're going? Downstairs, take my clothes off. I'm muddy. No, you're not. You're not going to mess up your mom's house with all the mud that you have. I looked at him. He took me out to the hydrant. And in that cold September, Thanksgiving day, November, whatever. It was cold. He washed me off with a cold water spray until I was clean. And then and only then would he let me go into the house, our house, my mother's house. You know, we have at a point... in our lives 
not been truthful with ourselves and with our Lord and Savior. And I'm going to illustrate that, and I'm going to refer to Psalms 120, verse 2, in the things that we should get rid out of our lives, along with being bullheaded. And it says in Psalms 120, verse 2, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. And I wanted to share a story with you about how that lying does not help you, but it comes around and you'll eventually get caught. I have two short stories. There was a gentleman, and he called his wife one day. And he had been asked to uh, go on a company trip and it was a fishing expedition to Canada. And the husband was to leave that evening. And he asked his wife if she would pack a few things for him. And he added, oh, by the way, please include my new silk pajamas. And as wives usually are, they're very smart and sometimes very suspicious of different things that we as husbands ask of them. <clears throat> she thought it sounded kind of fishy. When he returned from his trip, his wife asked, how did it go? And he said, great, great. Will, did you catch anything? Yes, I caught pike and I caught walleye. And then he asked, but why didn't you pack my blue silk pajamas? And she said, I did. They were in your tackle box. Brothers and sisters, lying, darkness, putting on your will instead of God's will are all ways that we walk in darkness. Now, I will tell you one thing. That was not me in the story about the fish, okay? But... Just a week and a half ago, I thought that I could keep something from my wife. I wasn't going to tell her that I had tried to fix the garage door opener and that I had stepped up on a, eh, a foot tall stool, or at least tried. I fell over, I bounced off the concrete floor, and I got up. No harm, no foul. I'm good. I got up and I walked. Three days later, I couldn't hardly move. And then I had to go into the doctor, and I took my wife with me because I couldn't really drive. And I raised my hand to Ammon Verdut, and you know Ammon, some of you. And I said, I, I can't tell a lie. I, I fell and I didn't want to tell my wife. and. You know, the sin of omission. What does that do? Where does that lead us? Should have been honest with my wife, but I wasn't. And now I had to face the truth because I couldn't walk until I got some medicine and the doctor helped me, you know, In and throughout all of this, what does Satan use? You know, when we go off and do our own thing, and then we come back in here. And I'm going to suggest that Satan uses the avenue of discouragement 
to his advantage. You know, in and throughout life, there's not one of us that will come up against anything that we might stumble across or stumble on. A roadblock that we have to walk around, that we have to step over. But I would like for you to listen, as I would encourage you to refer to Psalms 23. And then not only remember the words of Psalms 23, but what I'm going to bring to you in between those verses. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I would ask that you would trust Christ as your good shepherd to meet both you and your family's needs. And from John 3.16, for God so loved the world. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The Lord gives us rest and spiritual nourishment. that he gave his only begotten son he leadeth me beside the still waters he does calm our troubled souls with his spirit that whosoever believeth on him He restoreth my soul. He renews and refreshes our spirit continually when we spend time and effort to be with him. Should not perish. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. His holy word provides that guidance and teaches us how to live right. But have everlasting life. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For Christ has helped me overcome my fears. For God sent not his son. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He's always with us. Christ is there with us to help discipline and encourage us. This helps us to feel loved and secure. Into this world to condemn the world. But thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He gives us strength. He gives us strength with those who aren't with us. He gives us strength 
with his spirit. But that the world, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. He gives us abundance of blessings that through him we might be saved. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me in all the days of my life. Daily, he reminds us of his love and forgiveness. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You know, the Lord has brought to us a great understanding. I was sharing with Zach before we came out that I have seen the exploding of knowledge throughout the advent of computers and knowledge that has come about because I started out punching cards to program those big, massive computers that would fill this sanctuary. With all the technological advance that we have seen, and the developments that have accelerated throughout my lifetime, we still have a restlessness about us, a yearning to discover the reason for his existence in our soul. You know, it would be an endless search, but for the answers that are given to us in the scripture. From Philippians 3.10, we find these words. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made comfortable unto his death. If by any means I may attain, might attain unto the resurrection of the just. Not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also, I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press forward toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Would you agree with me that the person we spend the most time with is ourselves? And so it's fair, I think, that we also spend a lot of time thinking about ourselves. And I'm going to ask three questions. And this, the answers to these questions may or may not have come to you, nor may they come to you in a blink of an eye, it may be over a lifetime. But these are some questions that I've had to answer myself. Do you really like yourself? Would you rather be someone else?
And as you analyze yourself, I'm not talking about the book analyzation. I'm talking about with respect to God and Christ. Are you realistic about your strengths and weaknesses? Socrates was credited with saying, know thyself. Even though really what he was saying was the unexamined life is not worth living. Either way, I think the message is pretty clear. He was right. Knowing ourselves in relationship to God is the key to a meaningful life. Psalms 147, 7. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. Who covereth the heavens with cloud? Who prepareth rain for the earth? Who maketh grass grow? Upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens with cry. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse, he taketh pleasure not in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. You know, I'm guilty of this as the next. We humans are always trying to make a good impression on each other. Most people spend a great deal of time worrying about what everyone else is going to think about them. But I would challenge you this day that we are to be the most concerned about what God thinks. I'm inclined to believe that many of us overestimate the opinions of our fellow human beings. Many mistakes I've made in this life have had their root in trying to impress others over God. And it has caused great anxiety of heart. But understand this, it is not that I ever want to become insensitive to the needs and concerns of others. But I've discovered that God wants me to please an audience of one. When I seek to please him, he uses me to do what is most advantageous his will, and his pleasure for others. He uses me. In closing, I'd like to read these words from Matthew. Verse, chapter 22, starting at verse 34. 
Then one of them, a lawyer, tempting him, asking him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like an unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I would challenge you this day to seek, therefore, to please an audience of one. The light and the life of the world through our service to our Lord and Master, even Jesus the Christ.